2. Van Til Cornelius Van Til, born 1895, presents us with a systematic and rigorously biblical philosophy. In terms of this biblical commitment, Van Til's philosophy begins with certain clear-cut presuppositions. First, the sovereignty of the triune God and his ultimate decree are presupposed rather than the autonomy of man and man's mind. There is no less a given, a basic faith and presupposition in modern philosophy than there is in Van Til. As Van Til, Loewert and others have shown, a basic pre-theoretical and religious faith is a presupposition of every philosophy. Every philosophy is a development of the premises of its particular faith. Van Til's premise is the God of Scripture. Van Til makes clear the significance of this fact. That issue may be stated simply and comprehensively by saying that, in the Christian view of things, it is the self-contained God who is the final point of reference, while in the case of the modern view, it is the would-be self-contained man who is the final point of reference in all interpretation. For the Christian, facts are what they are in the last analysis by virtue of the place they take in the plan of God. Facts are inseparable from a principle of interpretation. The facts we know are interpreted facts. The question is this. Is the principle of interpretation the triune God of Scripture, or is it the autonomous mind of man? The mind of man is not neutral. Man is either a covenant keeper or a covenant breaker. Man has an axe to grind, and as a result, the covenant breaker man is anxious to keep from seeing the facts for what they really are. God's handiwork. For non-Christian philosophy, all predication that is to be meaningful must have its reference points in man as ultimate. We thus have two mutually exclusive systems based upon two mutually exclusive principles of interpretation. If man assumes himself to be ultimate rather than created, he will work to undercut God-given factuality. And in our day, the non-Christian principle of interpretation has come to a quite consistent form of expression. It is done so most of all by stressing the relativity of all knowledge in any field to man as its ultimate reference point. It would seem to follow from this that Christians ought not to be behind in stressing the fact that, in their thinking, all depends upon making God the final reference point in human predication. The sovereign God and his ultimate decree are thus basic. Second, Van Til's premise is the God of Scripture because Van Til accepts the Bible as the infallible Word of God. The self-contained God is self-determinate. He cannot refer to anything outside that which has proceeded from himself for corroboration of his words. The Word of God must, therefore, be our appeal and authority. The non-believer claims to be a new man by virtue of his independence from God and his declaration that he is his own reference point. He therefore opposes his word to God's word. Each position has a radically different epistemology. As Van Til sums it up, It is not apparent in what manner we would contend on our day for the philosophical relevance of Scripture. Such philosophical relevance cannot be established unless it be shown that all human predication is intelligible only on the presupposition of the truth of what the Bible teaches about God, man and the universe. If it be first granted that man can correctly interpret an aspect or dimension of reality while making man the final reference point, then there is no justification for denying him the same competence in the field of religion. If the necessity for the belief in Scripture is established in terms of experience, which is not itself interpreted in terms of Scripture, it is not the necessity of Scripture that is established. The Scripture offers itself as the sun by which alone men can see their experience in its true setting. The facts of nature and history corroborate the Bible when it is made clear that they fit into no frame but that which Scripture offers. 
if the non-believer works according to the principles of the new man within him and the Christian works according to the principles of the new man within him, then there is no interpretive content of any sort on which they can agree. They both maintain that their position is reasonable, both maintain that it is according to reason and according to fact, both bring the whole of reality in connection with their main principle of interpretation and their final reference points. It might seem then that there can be no argument between them. It might seem that the orthodox view of authority is to be spread only by testimony and by prayer, not by argument. But this would militate directly against the very foundation of all Christian revelation, namely, to the effect that all things in the universe are nothing, if not revelational of God. Christianity must claim that it alone is rational. It must not be satisfied to claim that God probably exists, nor does it say that Christ probably rose from the dead. The Christian is bound to believe and hold that his system of doctrine is certainly true and that other systems are certainly false, and he must say this about a system of doctrine which involves the existence and sovereign action of a self-contained God whose ways are past finding out. Because God is the sovereign, not man, it is the word of God which governs our thought rather than the word of man. Our presupposition then is that whatever Scripture teaches is true because Scripture teaches it. For the modernist, the ultimacy of the autonomous mind of man leads him to deny in principle the possibility of an infallible word of God, his frame of reference being himself, not God. In the last analysis, every theology or philosophy is personalistic. Everything impersonal must be brought into relationship with an ultimate personal point of reference. Orthodoxy takes the self-contained ontological trinity to be this point of reference. The only alternative is to make man himself the final point of reference. Third, in terms of the doctrine of the sovereign, uncreated God and his infallible word, Fantil affirms the doctrine of creation. Instead of one great chain of being, there is rather the uncreated being of God on the one hand and created being on the other. The doctrine of creation means that God as creator of all things is therefore of necessity the only true principle of interpretation for all things. Creationism means a different doctrine of immanence and transcendence than we find in non-biblical thought. Fourth, the doctrine of the Trinity is fundamental to Orthodox Christianity and to Van Til's philosophy. The three persons of the Trinity are co-substantial. Not one is derived in a substance from either or both of the others. Yet there are three distinct persons in this unity. The diversity and the identity are equally underived. God is thus ultimate, and the three persons of the Godhead have equal ultimacy. Fifth, it follows that, because all ultimacy is ascribed to God by the doctrine of creation, and equal ultimacy to the triune Godhead, the answer to the problem of the one and the many, is to be found in God. In the first place, we are conscious of having as our foundation the metaphysical presupposition of Christianity as it is expressed in the creation doctrine. This means that in God as an absolutely self-contained being, in God as an absolute personality, who exists as the triune God, we have the solution of the one and the many problem. The persons of the Trinity are mutually exhaustive. This means that there is no remnant of the unconsciousness of potentiality in the being of God. Thus there cannot be anything unknown to God that springs from his own nature. Then too, there was nothing existing beyond this God before the creation of the universe. Hence the time-space world cannot be a source of independent particularity. The space-time universe cannot even be a universe of exclusive particularity. It is brought forth by the creative act of God, and this means in accordance with the plan of the universal God. Hence, there must be in this world universals as well as particulars. Moreover, they can never exist in independence of one another.
they must be equally ultimate, which means, in this case, they are both derivative. Now, if this is the case, God cannot be confronted by an absolute particularity that springs from the space-time universe any more than he can be confronted by an absolute particularity that should spring from a potential aspect of his own being. Hence, in God the one and the many are equally ultimate, which in this case means absolutely ultimate. Because God is the creator of all things, the temporal one and many can never exist, either in isolation from or in contradiction to one another, nor in isolation from or in contradiction to the triune God, the ultimate one and many. The exclusive ultimacy of the one and the many is in God. Because of the fact of creation, the temporal one and many are not essentially alien things. In non-Christian thoughts, the one and the many are alien and are held in dialectical tension, lest the one reduce the other to nothing and itself to meaninglessness. The temporal one and many are absolutely under God and his law and absolutely subject to his creative purpose. Sixth, there is no tension between the temporal one and many because they are alike under God and because of the equal ultimacy of the eternal one and many in the triune God. The plurality and the unity of the Godhead are both equally ultimate. God is one God, three persons, and equal ultimacy is to be ascribed to both God's unity and particularity. The doctrine of the ontological trinity thus brings to an end the tension between the one and the many. It is not the one nor the many which is more important, and ultimacy is not the attribute of one alone, it is rather the equal ultimacy of the one and the many in the triune God. Non-Christian thought seeks to hold the one and the many in dialectical tension. Feeling this, it falls into dualism or monism. Van Til, distinguishing between the eternal one and many and the temporal one and many, points to the fact that Christian philosophy is thus able to give a comprehensive and unified picture of reality without doing any injustice either to unity or particularity or ascribing ultimacy to man and history. Using the language of the one and many question, we contend that in God the one and the many are equally ultimate. Unity in God is no more fundamental than diversity, and diversity in God is no more fundamental than unity. The persons of the Trinity are mutually exhaustive of one another. The Son and the Spirit are ontologically on a par with the Father. It is a well-known fact that all heresies in the history of the Church have in some form or another taught subordinationism. Similarly, we believe all quote-unquote heresies in apologetic methodology spring from some sort of subordinationism. It may be profitable at this juncture to introduce the notion of a concrete universal. In seeking for an answer to the one and many question, philosophers have admittedly experienced great difficulty. The many must be brought into contact with one another. But how do we know that they can be brought into contact with one another? How do we know that the many do not simply exist as unrelated particulars? The answer given is that in such a case we should know nothing of them. They would be abstracted from the body of knowledge that we have. They would be abstract particulars. On the other hand, how is it possible that we should obtain a unity that does not destroy the particulars? We seem to get our unity by generalizing, by abstracting from the particulars in order to include them into larger unities. If we keep up this process of generalization till we exclude all particulars, granted they can all be excluded, have we then not stripped these particulars of their particularity? Have we then obtained anything but an abstract universal? As Christians, we hold that there is no answer to these problems from a non-Christian point of view. We shall argue this point later. 
For the nonce, we introduce this matter in order to set forth the meaning of the notion of the concrete universal. It is only in the Christian doctrine of the triune God, as we are bound to believe, that we really have a concrete universal. In God's being, there are no particulars not related to the universal, and there is nothing universal that is not fully expressed in the particulars. The doctrine of the Trinity thus provides the key to the problem of the one and the many. In the Trinity, both particularity and unity are equally ultimate and equally concrete. The temporal one and many are created by God out of nothing, or better, God created the universe into nothing. Non-being is to be viewed as the field of God's possible operation by man, whereas for God, non-being is nothing in itself. The doctrine of creation means that the temporal one and many are under the determination of the eternal one and many. Creation, on Christian principles, must always mean fiat creation. Thus, there are no possibilities outside of God, nor any determination except from Him, who is the Creator, Determiner, and Sustainer of all things. Seventh, this means that the created one and many as God's creation is entirely and absolutely under God and His law. As Van Til summarises his philosophy on this point, If the creation doctrine is thus taken seriously, it follows that the various aspects of created reality must sustain such relations to one another as have been ordained between them by the Creator, as superiors, inferiors or equals. All aspects being equally created, no one aspect of reality may be regarded as more ultimate than another. Thus, the created one and many may in this respect be equal to one another, They are equally derived and equally dependent upon God who sustains them both. The particulars or facts of the universe do and must act in accord with universals or laws. Thus, there is order in the created universe. On the other hand, the laws may not and can never reduce the particulars to abstract particulars or reduce their individuality in any manner. The laws are but generalizations of God's method of working with the particulars. God may at any time take one fact and set it into a new relation to created law. That is, there is no inherent reason in the facts or laws themselves why this should not be done. It is this sort of conception of the relation of facts and laws, of the temporal one and many, embedded as it is in that idea of God in which we profess to believe, that we need in order to make room for miracles, and miracles are at the heart of the Christian position. Thus, there is a basic equality between the created one and the created many, or between the various aspects of created reality. On the other hand, there is a relation of subordination between them as ordained by God. The quote-unquote mechanical laws are lower than the teleological laws. Of course, both the mechanical and the teleological laws are teleological in the sense that both obey God's will. So also the facts of the physical aspect of the universe are lower than the facts of the will and intellect of man. It is this subordination of one facts and law to other facts and laws that is spoken of in Scripture as man's government over nature. According to Scripture, man was set as king over nature. He was to subdue it, yet he was to subdue it for God. He was priest under God as well as king under God. In order to subdue it under God, man had to interpret it. He was therefore prophet as well as priest and king under God. Eighth, because the world is totally under God and is absolutely determined by him, it is therefore a world with purpose and meaning. History is rescued from meaninglessness. It is no longer root factuality, meaningless and uninterpreted facts. It is no longer a matter of abstract particulars and abstract universals. It has purpose, meaning and direction, 
because God created it in terms of his ultimate decree and purpose, as Van Til has stated. The philosophy of history inquires into the meaning of history. To use a phrase of Kiekago, we ask how the moment is to have significance. Our claim as believers is that the moment cannot intelligently be shown to have any significance except upon the presupposition of the biblical doctrine of the ontological trinity. In the ontological trinity, there is complete harmony between an equally ultimate one and many. The persons of the trinity are mutually exhaustive of one another and of God's nature. It is the absolute equality in point of ultimacy that requires all the emphasis we can give it. Involved in this absolute equality, is complete interdependence. God is our concrete universal. We accept this God upon scriptural authority. In the Bible alone do we hear of such a God. When man seeks to find the meaning of history in history, he ends up denying the validity of history. When he seeks to explain the one and the many in terms of history, He ends up negating one or both and destroying meaning in either case. Concrete thinking means a positive approach. The ontological trinity will be our interpretive concept everywhere. God is our concrete universal. In him, thoughts and being are coterminous. In him, the problem of knowledge is solved. If we begin thus with the ontological trinity as our concrete universal, We frankly differ from every school of philosophy and from every school of science, not merely in our conclusions, but in our starting points and in our method as well. For us, the facts are what they are, and the universals are what they are, because of their common dependence upon the ontological trinity. Thus, the facts are correlative to the universals. Because of this correlativity, there is genuine progress in history. Because of it, the moments has significance. History is rescued from meaninglessness and man from its despair by means of this biblical philosophy. Such a philosophy differs sharply in kind from its rivals. It is not another variation on a common theme, nor another form of idealism. Here is neither nominalism nor realism, nor a combination of the two. Here is thinking done on the basis of the self-authenticating revelation of God. Here is the theology in which the primacy of faith over reason means that reason, or intellect, is saved from the self-frustration involved in the denial, virtual or open, of such a God and of such a Christ. Only those who know that they are not infallible but are, by virtue of ever-present sin within them, in spite of their regeneration by the Holy Spirit, inclined to suppress this revelation, also know that they need such a God, such a Christ, and his infallible word to tell them the truth which alone can set them free. For theirs is the knowledge that only by having such a God as their personal God does their search for knowledge have any meaning. The premises of such a philosophy are thus clearly and radically different than those of all non-biblical philosophy. It means a radical break and division also as far as non-biblical attempts at theism are concerned, for such attempts can allow for nothing that is not, in principle, penetrable to the human mind. Such a view implies that we, as human beings, are to be our own ultimate judges. If the facts which face man are already interpreted by God, man needs not and cannot face them as brute facts. If the facts which man faces are really God-interpreted facts, man's interpretation will have to be, in the last analysis, a reinterpretation of God's interpretation. The new theology gives us a so-called sovereignty of grace which creates a sovereignty that is common to God and man It tries to give us a Jesus who is separated from the all-inclusive providence of God. The new theology culminates in the death of God theologians, who can rightfully claim Kant as their father 
as can the liberal theologians before them, we have set ourselves free from the God who is transcendent, but to do so we have had to make ourselves transcendent. To keep the transcendent God from hemming us in through the laws of the created universe, we must ourselves take the place of that God by acting as the source of all law in that universe. We must speak the language of freedom, of creation, of sin and of ethical advance of the individual and of the race in terms of our own free self, that is, in terms of our self as wholly transcendent. We have now to learn to speak two languages, the language of faith and the language of science. We have to speak the language of pure indeterminate ethical freedom and the language of pure determinate science. Because of their rejection of the triune God, of the eternal one and many, the new theologians find themselves, despite their vaunted liberation, still boxed in by the dialectical tension of nature and freedom, the universal and the particular. They have not advanced the problem towards any solution. René Descartes tried to explain how he himself was the final source of predication when he said, Cogito ergo sum, but soon enough he found that he could say nothing about himself except in terms of God and the world which he had first excluded. Mindful of this failure of Descartes, Kant sought for his self-identity by asserting his freedom from all dependence upon the laws of the space-time world or of the laws of morality as revealed by God, but then he found that his freedom was merely a negative freedom. As a result, he could not find himself. His noumenal man is free, but free in an unintelligible vacuum. When, after that, Kant too sought for a renewed relationship of his free self with God and the world, it was in both cases at the expense of his freedom. The famous aphorism of Goethe, the great German poet, illustrates the predicament of the free self who wants to be free by being a law unto himself. Goethe said, When the individual speaks, it is, alas, no longer the individual that speaks. These men have denied metaphysics in the name of a new metaphysics. In ethics, in the place of Christ, they have substituted the assumption that right is right because man, as ethically autonomous, says it is right, and that wrong is wrong because man, as ethically autonomous, says it's wrong. The issues have been made sharper and clearer by the writings of the Death of God theologians. All reasoning and all verification in which any man engages rests ultimately either on the authority of man himself as autonomous and ultimately self-interpreting or upon the authority of the Christ of the New Testament who says that he alone knows whence he came and whither he is going. The self-attesting Christ is the presupposition of all intelligible predication. The God is dead theologians have helped us to see this fact more clearly than ever. Their negations negate themselves. Or we may say that their negations cannot even negate themselves because they have nothing to stand on when they make their predications. The Christ of the Scriptures as the Son of God upholds them in his hand even as they deny him. Society does not speak of the matter of the one and the many. Most people are ignorant of the problem, even though it is basic to all life and thought. But because of man's failure to solve the problem, society is caught in the continuing tensions of alternating anarchy and totalitarianism between anarchic individualism and anarchic collectivism. Philosophy has in recent years abandoned the battlefield for the academic sterility of logical analysis. If there is to be any kind of Christian reconstruction, then in every area of thought the philosophy of Cornelius van Til is of critical and central importance. 